seen the Hollywood interpretations of robots taking over. But could this be a reality? So who knows, maybe at some point we will indeed have what many science fiction authors are prophesied. Uh, we will have um, a robot civilization. This is part one of my three-part interview with Jürgen Schmiduber, the director of the Swiss Lab of Artificial Intelligence. He tells us if these dramatized theories could hold any validity in the future. So let's start off. Um, for our viewers, can you kind of break down exactly what artificial intelligence is? Well, it's supposed to be almost the same thing as natural intelligence, except, as you may have guessed, it's artificial. That is, it's running on a different substrate, not necessarily on a human brain like this one, but instead on a computer that is learning to control devices such as robots or whatever it is to um, interact with an initially unknown world and then become a smarter and smarter problem solver over time, just like a little baby, eventually um, acquiring all the problem-solving capacity that we see in biological beings, including humans, and then at some point maybe even go beyond that. So what right now is separating artificial intelligence from intelligence? Artificial intelligence obviously is just a subset of intelligence, which also includes natural intelligence. It's not really separated from intelligence, it's a particular instance of intelligence which um, you hopefully will soon find on all kinds of artificial devices such as computers and cell phones and whatever. So do computers have artificial intelligence in them now? One has to be careful here. We have computers that sometimes exhibit certain aspects of intelligence. For example, they can do certain things that humans can do, and they can sometimes even do these things better or faster, such as playing chess or recognizing patterns or controlling robots. However, um, all those fields in which uh, computer specialists are outperforming humans, such as, for example, chess, are considered soon not very intelligent activity anymore because, by definition, the one thing that still um, invokes the, the idea of intelligence is the thing that you don't understand. So if you can program a computer to play chess as well as a human be being, then many people would say, hmm, probably chess playing is not really intelligence. So what exactly does your work consist of right now at the Swiss Lab of Artificial Intelligence? Uh, relevant to this discussion is uh, certainly our work on uh, optimal artificial intelligence. So it turns out that there is a best possible way of building problem solvers that over time learn through experience from the environment, through interaction with the environment, in a mathematically optimal way. That is, uh, blueprints of artificial intelligences already exist, and even um, blueprints of artificial intelligence that are mathematically optimal in certain senses. That is, unlike uh, just a couple of years ago, or at least uh, in the previous millennium, we now have a theory of artificial intelligence that is not just um, a collection of heuristics, but really rooted in mathematical um, optimality proofs. On the other hand, we have um, very practical, brain-inspired artificial intelligences that can at least learn to solve certain, certain tasks that seem to be unlearnable just a couple of uh, years or decades ago um, in a way that is um, inspired by, by the workings of human brains. And it turns out that we can um, do all kinds of um, rather impressive uh, pattern recognition tasks uh, in a way that um, is even, that is not surpassed by humans. Now, you've mentioned a lot in past presentations about the singularity. Um, you call it omega. Uh, you define it as being the year when AI will um, make 40,000 years of human-dominated history converge. So can you kind of elaborate on this theory? Well, um, over the past 100 years, many, many people have uh, noticed that history seems to accelerate and move on more and more rapidly. And within a single human lifetime now, apparently, we can experience more change than in 1,000 years before. 
And so a long list of science fiction writers has produced stories about this um, acceleration of history. And in fact, um, many people have um, speculated that all of this is going to, um, to accelerate so rapidly that the, the um, time intervals between successive major um, events in the history of humankind uh, are separated by a constant factor. In other words, that each um, time interval of that type is by a constant factor shorter than the time interval before, which means that it should converge in finite time. And so, in fact, a couple of years ago, I studied the most important events in history as indicated by the chapters in the history books. And it turns out that there is indeed a very simple pattern which seems to indicate that history is going to converge around the year 2040, roughly, more or less. Decade, more or less, isn't really that important, uh, given that we are looking at a time span of 40,000 years. So some people call this uh, the singularity. It was popularized by... Uh, Werner Winge in the 1980s, he coined this notion of a technological singularity where each new progress comes twice as fast or three times as fast or at least a constant factor as fast as the previous one, which means it has to converge in finite time. And he explored the consequences of that um, idea in many science fiction novels. He was not the first to put it forward. However, he was the first who popularized it. Um, I prefer the name Omega mostly because that's what uh, Teilhard de Chardin called it 100 years ago and because it sounds so much like, um, oh my God. A little bit more um, shocking. <laughs> so do you see it being like the Hollywood interpretations of robots walking among us and working for us? Well, that's certainly uh, the economic motivation for doing all of this because uh, many people in my field um, are trying to build machines that, um, that can do things that uh, were reserved for humans. For example, in our agriculture, you are trying to, um, to replace tough work um, in the field by robots. In, in many applications, um, in factories, you can expect um, robots to be able to do things that currently still require human pattern recognition and um, human manipulation abilities. But I guess in a couple of years or decades, much of that will be overtaken by machines, which then, of course, should be viewed as allies. These would be the near-term consequences, which are pretty predictable, I think. And then, of course, there are the separate long-term consequences of dealing with minds that are maybe smarter than ours. So you've mentioned the word allies. On this more skeptical side of things, do you think that we're creating an ally or a potential enemy? Well, in the short term, certainly allies, because obviously much of these artificial intelligences that we are creating today, these very rudimentary artificial intelligences, they are helping us in many ways. Search engines are using all kinds of um, um, so-called artificial intelligence algorithms to give you good results as you're searching for information. And there's a lot of um, methods uh, which are subsumed under this expression artificial intelligence, which are today already widely used and make your uh, life easier. So that part of it uh, certainly is worth um, being considered as an ally. On the other hand, uh, as you seem to indicate in your question, there are these concerns about the long-term consequences.